All right, everybody, welcome back to the Mindful Hunter podcast. I'm your host, as always, Jay Nickel, and we're continuing the Founders series this week with Kurt Racicott, who founded and is the lead designer for Stone Glacier, joining us this morning. So, Kurt, um, thanks again for taking the time. I truly appreciate it. Oh, you bet. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So let's let's back up a little bit. Um, where, where does your story as a hunter begin? Do you come from a hunting family? Yeah, I do. Uh, so grew up uh, here in, in Montana, over in the western part of the state, outside of Missoula. And uh, so fourth generation Montanan and hunting had been in my family for at least at least when my family first moved to the state. And and but it was primarily from like the, the hunter gatherer type situation right. where that, 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 that's where the meat came from for the year. And it was the same way when I was growing up. Uh, my dad introduced me to hunting and he had grown up hunting himself. And it was about trying to harvest a deer or an elk or, or to have the meat for the winter. And, and then once I moved to Bozeman, a little better elk populations, it, you just had that opportunity to kind of take that the hunting to the next level when, when I was here in college. And then, of course, uh, then when I moved to Alaska, you're kind of taking it that next step. So, yeah, a broad overview. That was kind of how, how I grew up and, and how I got more into it. Do you think there's been a significant shift? Like, it's interesting that you noticed, you know, the, the better populations of elk and stuff. Was there, I'm always fascinated with this in the States because there seems to be such a stark contrast. Do you feel like you grew up, there was a significant difference in kind of population density and trophy quality, for lack of a better term, uh, between then and what you'd see now in Montana? Yes. Um, well, I think that that's, that, that's interesting because it's kind of twofold. You can look at the the numbers and the statistics tell you, especially here where we live in, in the Bozeman area, the greater Yellowstone area, when you look at the 90s and into um, even the, the early 2000s, just the number of elk that were in that greater area, including yep. the Gallatin and the Paradise and, of course, Yellowstone itself, substantially more. And you could tell that by the number of tags that they gave out they had. They had late season hunts when I was growing up and even when I was in college that would go from the end of rifle season all the way through, I, I want to say it was end of February. Wow. And they would have four day seasons and there was just an enormous amount of elk and you don't see that now. Okay. Um, but I do think that it's interesting when you say trophy quality that what was it three, four years ago or whatever, the, yep. the new world record archery elk was taken. So I, I, I think that we're seeing some interesting things and in the same thing with bighorn sheep. Um, and so quality versus numbers, uh, I think that they're in different spots, but it, yeah, it, it's a complicated subject, but there certainly are not the numbers here that there used to be. Yeah. I'm always, I find it very interesting that each state kind of plants its flag like are we an opportunity state or are we a quality state and i do feel like montana is one of those ones that kind of bridges the gap you know i opportunity is clearly very important to the state but also i mean if you look at the size of the animals that are being taken clearly there's being some priority put on trophy class as well and and coming from a guy who's you know been fortunate enough to hunt Montana a couple times, it is one of those places where there are these little known nooks and crannies with really high quality animals, and then there's other areas where you're going to see a lot, but you're probably not going to see anything impressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that that's exactly what we have. Um, and 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 I think that it also kind of goes by species as well. Um, I, I I know it's. It's getting tougher and tougher to find high quality mule deer in the state. And, and it's always been tough. We have a couple of uh, pretty good units, but the odds are you know, astronomical to draw a tag too. Yeah. So, but the opportunities there. So I, yeah, overall, I think that our state does a great job. And I think keeping in mind that it's a huge undertaking to try to manage the state. And just like so many of our government entities uh, underfunded, um, in, in many cases, understaffed or could always use more help. Um, 
so yeah I, I think overall they do a great job for for the job that they have to do yeah it just uh, you know viewing things as an outsider i would agree so I, I always kind of like to see myself as a bit of a glutton for punishment. I enjoy the backcountry. I enjoy some solo stuff, but I feel like you're 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 like a whole other step up for me. Like some of the the, the places you go and, and some of the pack weights and stuff, I still have problems like wrapping my head around it. When did you like? When did that hit for you? Like when did you realize that you know? there was another level of hunting that kind of grabbed your soul. That was more than just the sustenance, but it was also this, I was trying to explain it to somebody the other day that there's almost an element of hunting that I use as an instrument to test myself, to see what I'm capable of. When did, when did that light go on for you that you would like, there's more to this that kind of resonates with me. Yeah. I would say a majority of that happened when I moved to Alaska right out of college and okay. and loving the outdoors, whether it be hunting or fishing, but primarily hunting at that point. And then once I got to Alaska, having the opportunity to hunt sheep and goats, I had done a little bit of it here in the state, not goats, but uh, sheep with other people who had tags. And it was super interesting. but. To be able to hunt those areas in Alaska for dull sheep and and it, it was more the area and the style of hunting that, that really drew me in more so than the animal itself. I think the the love for for hunting sheep started with just being in existing, living, spending time in in that upper alpine area, and then of course, if you want to do that, everything else comes with it. So having all it, you know, everything that you need, uh, having to have extended trips. Um, if you want to go by yourself, just the amount of planning and, and, um, and being, being focused on the details. Um, and I, I think the whole package over the course of three or four years was really what drew me to continue to, to want to do those Alpine style hunts. You know, this is a really interesting insight you're bringing up, and I don't think I've ever really put these two pieces together. So my professional background before I got into what I'm into now was forestry, and I was a forestry engineer for 15 years in British Columbia, and pretty remote stuff, like heli shows, and like, so I got a chance to go, and my job was like to go find timber where other people had never gone before, so it was literally like getting paid to explore the mountains. So when I, when I started getting into hunting kind of later on in life, I was immediately drawn to the back country, but my first love was archery hunting elk. And what, what I realized later on was that I was making the hunt fit. Like I was actually going on poor elk hunts because of where I wanted to go elk hunting. Like I wanted to be really far away from everything. And I actually came to find out years later, like, this is not the best way to hunt elk. Like, there's much more successful, like, bivy hunting from the truck, and you're probably only three, four miles from most trailheads, and maybe only a mile off of, like, a really well-beaten trail. Like, and that was when, so I'm only a couple years deep into my sheep and goat journey, and then I almost found out in reverse, I was like, oh, where I want to be is up there on these really long trips, I'm not supposed to be chasing elk up there on these really long trips. I'm supposed to be chasing deer or sorry, elk, or sorry, sheep and goat. And that, that, that was when I had the realization, like it's more about the place and the adventure. And I don't want to say the animal is secondary because clearly that's the, that's the ultimate goal. But when I'm planning trips, I almost look at where first and then what as a, as a secondary element of, of the plan. So that's a really interesting insight. I, I would agree. It's that it's the remoteness in the wilderness that kind of draws me out. And then it's like, okay, what else is up there that I can spend my time chasing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I find as I get older, I, I do that even more. Right. I, I look at those days with family, with work, it, those days are very precious. So yeah, I, I would like to fill a tag, but even more so, I want to have a great experience because that's what right. I've that's what I've trained for all year. That's that's where I want to be. It's where I'm happy. It's um, it's what fills my cup. So, yeah, hopefully there are some animals around while you're doing it. But yeah, I, I, that, that's that's a huge part for me. 
Well, and we can see this from some of your, what do they, what do they call those? You're known for doing these, um, what are the areas in Montana where they have the, it's kind of like an open sheet, but once it's filled, it's, it's done. Yeah. They, there are uh, several unlimited sheep units is what they call them. Right. But these are t- typically very low odds hunts. Like you're, they, it's not a great likelihood that you're going to run into a lot of sheep on these hunts. So if you don't have a great love for, for being out there in the process, it's probably not the hunt for, for most people. No, that's, that's a pretty good way to put it. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, they are. They they are very low. There are several units. For example, one of the units this year they they open up middle of September and run all the way through the end of November, and they only took one ram out of one unit. The unit that I was in closed early, and I don't know that they have that they took a ram out of the unit that was next to me in that entire time. So it it's very hit or miss uh, as far as locating. It's all wilderness, um, but. It's fantastic, wild country, and especially for the lower 48, I'd argue it's some of the wildest country that, that we can access. And and so, yeah, the adventure that you could have back in there and, and the ability to get away from people. For example, I, on my hunt this year, I went 10 days and I didn't see another person. Right. So those types of places are getting harder and harder to find, especially in the lower 48. Yep. Yeah. We're, we're still pretty blessed here in BC. I took a real big gamble on my sheep hunt this year and I actually picked something. I couldn't find a forum mention of it. I couldn't like, I was specifically looking for something that no one else had referenced, almost taking like the long shot that there's either some big bruiser ram in here that no one has ever seen, or I'm going to see nothing ended up seeing nothing, but it was also the most remote I've ever been. Like even on float plane trips, you always end up seeing something like some dried boot tracks in the mud or an old fire pit or like there people have been in these areas. And for the majority of the, this hunt, until I got closer to the pickup lake that was more heavily trafficked, I, it was like nothing. Like I like, and even the, Urs, the pilot, he's been flying up there for almost 40 years. And when he dropped me off, he goes, I think I've been to this lake three times. And I was like, <laughs> all right, okay. And, and, and he goes, I think they, I think it was, I think those were all moose hunts. And I was like, okay, <laughs> maybe not the best choice, but I got what I like, again, if the ultimate priority was that uh, kind of intensity of the remote wilderness, like it was there, man, it was definitely the most kind of severe trip I've, I've ever had. So, okay. So we moved to Alaska. We start doing more of the backcountry stuff. At what point have you always been a gear nerd or is there a point when you're like, okay, this, and maybe give me a, a, like, what year is this? So I get an idea of the type of gear you were using. And when did you first realize I'm not satisfied with the stuff that I have access to currently? Yes. So when I first moved, to Alaska, that was 1998, 98, I believe. So, okay. and, and I wasn't necessarily a gear nerd or gear junkie at that time. I just showed up with the stuff that I used in Alaska and found out that it was dangerous. Okay. A lot of wool, a lot, of, just did not have the right gear. And, and, and so that's kind of where that, where that portion came in was it was more out of necessity finding that you need to change more to a mountaineering style type package yep yep from from the ground up because here was wool pack boots all of those types of things and and those will work for certain types of hunts in alaska but not wet alpine where you can't start a fire those types of situations you need a different kit so that's really where it all started and had played around with several different types of packs and designs, but really started chasing the mountaineering gear and finding that those were going to be my best options and then followed in with the mountaineering style packs. But they're just not built yeah. to carry a hundred or a hundred plus pounds. <clears throat> so you can get a lightweight platform, but then you pay for it on the other side when you're packing out. And a lot of them too didn't really have the volume that the, the, a majority of them don't. 
so that that's that's where it started for me was to try to solve that portion of it and then even when you look into the early 2000s there were some hunting companies that were making packs but nothing that you would consider really lightweight and some of them were blends it was it was kind of the start of all of that and and uh i mean the I'm trying to think of the Sitkas, the Kuyus, the, the big ones that we see out there right now, none of those were in existence. So if you wanted to shop for things, it was it was Barney's in Anchorage and and it was Cabela's. That's right. the, there wasn't a lot outside of there. So that's that that's where that all started. And then but it pretty quickly you could find out that the Mountaineers had that figured out. Right. And so being able to fill that part of your kit in, at least keep yourself warm, dry, have the, the, the layers that you need, that, that one was pretty easy. The pack portion, not so much. There was, so what I was really trying to do ultimately was to drop the weight on my entire package that I was carrying, everything that I had on my back. I knew that I knew that I was capable of about 110 to 115 pounds in okay. that country to be able to move one trip, to be able to do it safely. Um, and that would allow me to make one trip in, one trip out. So if you just add 25 pounds, it, it, it brought that to it brought it to a point where I couldn't move through a lot of that country and under yeah. that, that type of load. So that's that's where I was trying to drop the, the weight on the entire package and the and the pack was the last portion. So I was sitting in a pack that was close to 10 pounds. I had tried a couple of the North Face Arcterics, but they were a little bit too light as far as what they would carry um, stability wise. So that's when I started playing with some of my own designs and it, it took. I mean, it's hard to say two, two and a half years that, that I was playing with, with different types of things, but I started with, taught myself how to sew and then made modifications to certain packs and bags that I had and started to put different kits together. And then, but ultimately ended up at a spot where I had an entirely new platform. So it was a, a different frame, a different bag, the entire uh, load shelf system, all of that. And that's really where the idea for Stone Glacier first started. Now, when you're first starting to do this at the very beginning, is there ever a thought that scalability, I'm going to make a business, or is this at the beginning purely driven from like, I got a problem and I need to solve it because I want to go hunting and the gear doesn't exist that I need right now? It was, yeah, choice B. It was was definitely that... I didn't have any intentions of starting a business. Okay. And really, even after I had the design, I still had reached out to a couple of other companies to see if they would be interested in the design. Because really, I I just thought it works well for me. It has to work well for other people. And I wasn't even looking at it from really a monetary standpoint where I wanted to make a bunch of money off of it or do anything. I just, I had a lot of time and effort invested in it. And I didn't want to just see it sit in the corner and yeah. you know, be another story of, well, I could have, or I should have. And so that's really where I was shopping it around, but everybody had their own program going at that point. So there, there were, weren't any other businesses that were interested in it. So then it came down to, if I wanted to do it, I was going to have to do it myself. And, and that was really the only goal was to bring it to market and not just have it be this dead idea or to down the road say, well, I thought of something that was real similar to that. I could have done that. So it's just kind of ruling out regret. Now, when you launched Stone Glacier, you were still in Alaska, correct? Um, I was, I was, so I was going back and forth at that point. Okay. Um, yeah, my wife and I had moved back to Bozeman, but I was still, um, working in Alaska at that point. I was working two weeks on two weeks off. So you'd come back down to Montana for the two weeks yeah. off. That that was right about the time when we transitioned. We sold our home in Alaska, and then we moved down to Montana full time. Okay. And so what do those early days look like from a production standpoint? Are you outsourcing to a local sewing house? Are you making everything internally, like in the garage? What's that look like? Yeah, we, I had hired a cut and sew facility 
okay. to make all of them. It was it was just so it's so slow to do them one piece at a time, right? Especially from the cutting process to the sewing process, and so I had I had researched and contacted a, a couple of different production facilities and said, "Here's my plan." I talked to my wife and said. I just want to pull enough out of savings to do 60 backpacks. That's okay. it. So if we sell those 60 backpacks, we can reassess at that point. We'll roll it over into, we'll do some more. I wasn't looking to quit my job. It was definitely just going to be a side uh, side business. And I said, but that that's all that we'll invest in it. So it's either going to float itself or it's not. And how was that received? Because I, I almost think this is a topic that isn't explored enough, especially in in hunting. Like, not, not like support from our significant others is unbelievably important. And I'm extremely lucky. Both me and my wife are entrepreneurs, so we kind of have that in. But what was her response this whole time? Clearly, she sees you tinkering away. She sees how how passionate you are. You're clearly a, a driven guy. Is she is she hesitant? Is she both feet in? What's that relationship like at the time? Well, she could see how much time I had spent in it and how right. passionate I was about it. And so she was, she was all in and, okay. and she, but she was also, you do your thing. Right. And, and also keeping in mind that we already spend two weeks of every month apart. We're, tar- yeah. we're st- talking about starting a family. So let's just kind of all be on the same page where there's balance and still family time. So you're not working 80, 90 hours a week for two weeks and then coming home and working another 60, 70 hours a week for two weeks straight, that doesn't create a lot of balance. And I said, nope, that, that sounds great by me. And so that that's what we did. And yeah, we had, uh, fortunately, this production facility was willing to do it for, do 60 packs for us. And then we sold those. It was about two, two and a half months, rolled all that money back in. I think did a hundred packs the next time, sold all those, rolled it back in, did 125 the next time and just kept bouncing it up. And yeah, so it was, it was kind of a slow process there in the beginning. Yeah. That's, that's interesting because you almost like Stone Glacier, didn't you guys get an award from one of the fastest growing outdoor companies in North America a year or two ago? Yeah, yeah we did. So I do feel like people think Stone Glacier was this company that like kind of came on the scene and just instantly exploded, but that's clearly not the case. Like there was definitely this kind of gradual iterative process. Yeah. The first, it, it, specifically the first four years, okay. first four years as, as, as we just expanded it, because of my mindset with it was still the same. This is all that we're going to invest in it. And yep. so when, when a business is growing organically, you know, from being an entrepreneur that there's only a certain amount of whatever proceeds you have, you're, you're pretty limited without a, a big shot of cash. Yep. It's, it's, it's going to be that incremental step. And so that, that's, that's where we remained, but it was also a safe spot. It, uh, I think that it was a good thing for, for us. It was a good thing for me in, in business and that you learned a lot along the way. Um, we didn't leverage anything where you had to make any bad decisions, right? We were in hundred yep. percent control of everything. Um, and so in the long run, I, I think that was good for the growth process. I think you limit risk as well. It was funny. I was, I was talking to Steve from XO last week along the same lines about how they grew. And when they got one, when one of their significant milestones, um, they ended up having an issue with some of the aluminum in one of the frames and they'd grown to such a scale that it was like, it was a very big deal financially, like very, very big deal. And early on when you're running 60 and 120 batch lots, you make a mistake, like, listen, yes, it's nobody enjoys it, but it, it, you're not going to lose your house over it. Like it's, it, 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 it helps you keep that risk to a manageable size. Now this really early phase is interesting to me because I think that's almost more important to people like going from zero to one is almost more important than how to go from one to a hundred for a lot of people that would listen to my podcast, for example, were there any like issues or real learnings from that early phase that you would maybe do differently or affected how you did things moving forward? 
Hmm. I wouldn't say that there's anything that I would do differently. You can always look back and say, if you would have had all the cards out in front of you and known from the beginning, you could have moved more efficiently through there and, and grown faster. But, but there, there were so many important things that came from, I won't say bad decisions, but yeah, yeah. decisions you didn't have the information 100% on mm -hmm. that, that have, have led to where we're at right now. I think it's just kind of part of the, the growth process. Um, so no, I, I don't have any regrets on, on any of those portions. There were lots of things along the way that, for example, the biggest crux for us as we moved through was partnering with Jeff Spazito. And yeah, then we did that in late 2016. And that was the point where we really were able to put together a plan to take it to the next level. Okay. And, and really you get to a point, at least I did, where you realize there are limitations in what you can do by yourself. There are limitations in the amount of time that you have. And, and so being able to partner with somebody that, that has the same belief system that you do is talented on their own right on their side and you can pair those two things together and then bring in other talented people hopefully more talented than you i mean that's mm -hmm. the key if you can do that and then now you have so many more opportunities uh, opportunities for growth opportunities for new ideas opportunities for efficiency there you can just i think the team is really the key at that point more so than the product. Yeah, this this I find particularly interesting. So I'm a business consultant by trade and I deal with kind of behavioral insights and behavioral sciences and work a lot with startups and VCs and stuff like that. And one of the things you see happen a lot in the tech space is that best founders don't make the best CEOs and that what got you here won't get you there. And one of the things I find very interesting with Stone Glacier is that you're the designer, you're not the CEO. And I find a lot of, founders are so in love with their product and I don't, you know, in their own ideas, I think they have a hard time, especially in the outdoor space, migrating away and giving up control and, and honestly assessing like, what are my strengths and why did I get into this in the first place? Was that a hard thing for you to come to grips with? Or did you have a lot of self-awareness around that from earlier on that like, listen, this is where I can deliver value best and where I want to focus a lot of my time and all this other stuff needs to be done to, to build this company, but I'm not the guy who's best suited to do that. Was that, was that a struggle for you? Or was that something you saw pretty clearly early on? Um, I think it was a little bit of both because okay. I knew, I knew what, what my skill set was best doing and, and, and you start to, you being in business know this, you start to look at, okay, so if I don't relinquish some of these responsibilities, what's moving the needle more? Me over here doing a job that I'm not as efficient as, as somebody else would be, or me focusing on what I have going here. So I, I had the awareness to know that my skills, my experience needed to be used in that product development design area and there was more than enough work for one maybe even two people even at the time i always felt like i was behind so the key to it for me was partnering with somebody who had that vision for the company and that passion for stone glacier wanting to see it grow but also just kind of the whole mentality the, that we've tried to maintain here from our everything from our customer service to being very open-minded about feedback to, you know, just all the little intricacies as they trickle down through that might just be this one little part of the business that actually makes the personality of the business. So I, I think that as soon as we found that, and especially with Jeff and, and the team, then it was easy after that part. It was easy to relinquish any of those things that, that I felt that I had to manage beforehand. Okay, interesting. So let's talk about um, kind of product 
diversity strategy. Because at the beginning, Stone Glacier was a pack company. It was known for packs. It was respected for, for packs. And then you started to branch out. And I would say in a very measured fashion, you did not come out with a whole catalog overnight. It was like one or two pieces of gear, test them, tweak them, another one or two pieces of gear. So it's almost like a, a bit of a, a hybrid strategy. Like we are going to add SKUs, but we're not going crazy. What were those conversations like? And what, what kind of led you to that decision that yes, Stone Glacier, there's more to Stone Glacier than just packs? Yeah, well, in the beginning, I think that it was just bandwidth. Of course, I, I had, as a designer, I always looked at all of the things that I was using, and we all have ideas on what would work, what, what could be improved upon, what you'd like to change if you could work from the ground up. So whether it was tents, sleeping bags, apparel, I had always had those ideas floating around, but never the time or the bandwidth to be able to, to attack them. Right. And the business didn't have that at, at that point either. So really, once we got to that point, that point where now we have some time, now we can start to look at certain pieces that we're using, that we're buying from somebody else that we think that we could, we can come up with a design that better fits exactly what we want to do. Right. And specifically with backpack hunting. And, and taking into account all of those types of, uh, I don't know, different intricacies that, that come in from wearing a backpack and being out multiple days. So that's where that started. And, and so we started to look at the different pieces of gear that we were using of other people's, assess what we thought would work, what wouldn't work. Uh, and it really started from a high level of, of problem solving just like with the backpack. And so then we just put everything down in a priority list and started to work through it. And if it made sense, we weren't going to make something just to make something, just to fill right. a slot. If we were able to come up with something that worked better with the, with the gear that we already have, then let's test it and make sure. If not, let's scrap it. So and that's, that's what, kind of been our mentality. Excellent. So what would a typical product development cycle look like for you? And maybe like take something like Gators, for example, because I think you guys did something I would argue fundamentally different in the class. I think Gators kind of had this like 15 year stagnant, you know, they just, it was the same. Everybody ran OR Crocs, to be honest. And then yeah. in the last five years, I think there's been some really interesting kind of developments come on the scene. But when you say to yourself, like, give me an idea of the time scale from like, you say to yourself, you know what, this isn't as good as, as I, as I think it could be. I think I can make a, a significant uh, improvement in this space to the point where you, you, you actually let something go out on the market. Yeah. So it, it really depends on the product. Uh, right. I take Gators, for example, that was a very slow process. Right. So I started working on those in, well, the first set I used during the fall was fall of 2018. So it was almost three years before we released wow. them, but it was kind of, a, it, it was the same thing where we would test, but if it's not doing exactly exactly what you want it to do. If it's not hitting the standards, then we need to go back to the drawing table and figure out what it is. And that one was a prime example of looking at, at some of the things that I personally deal with. So for example, the, the broken buckle. So trying to come yeah. up with a pinless broken buckle, uh, being able to have a removable, replaceable bootstrap, because Unfortunately, you, you, you make them as tough as you can, but people wear out an entire set of boots in a year in some cases. So the strap is going to go with it. Yes. Um, being able to deal with the different circumferences of people's legs and being able to keep a tight seal at the top. And so uh, when I incorporated a piece of elastic in with the webbing so that you can have a constant pressure, but then you can also vary with how many layers you have on. So you get the extra overlap. There were just a few of those things that had to come about just by testing right. and trying. And so that one was a little bit slower, but I would say, 
I'd say generally speaking, I try to go on any new piece we have, go an entire fall of testing before we ever run into production. And most of the time, especially with our backpacks, the Terminus, I had a year and a half on that. Well, maybe even a little bit longer than that before we were even at a final design. And then it went into testing. So there are some things where if there's enough that's different or if I don't have enough experience, knowledge with that particular design, then it takes a little bit longer. When you look at some, say, our new bags for our packs, those move quite a bit quicker because right. a lot of times it's different pockets and it's, um, but they're still attaching the same way. The structural things that take time to test are still the same, are proven designs. So those ones might move a little bit quicker, but um, not much less than 18 months. Yeah, I don't think most people understand the timelines that, and even like I've got some pretty big apparel clients like Lululemon, Adidas, Arcteryx, and even those guys for most of their stuff are, are at least like two to three years from inception to market. Um, and I think hunting, especially now that I focus so much of my energy on reviews, hunting itself presents challenges because it's not like we're making running shoes where you can just go running anytime you want. If it was raining, you could rent a track. It's like, it's such a weird, varied set of circumstances that we only get this limited exposure to that creates this annual cyclicality to our lives because it's like, you're really only going to get to test it, test it in the, the real proving grounds on a limited basis compared to, you know, other sports or tactical related gear where you can replicate those circumstances a little more reliably. Yeah, I agree. It is. It's, it's very difficult to replicate that because even if you take a piece of gear and you take a 10 day hunt, getting somebody to be able to take it for 10 days and use it hard, th those, those opportunities are few and far between. Mm -hmm. And 10 days is a super short cycle to ever test anything. Yeah. So you, you get these conflicting, I don't know, goals that you have and it does, it just takes time. And the and 10 days can be so different. This was the thing I ran into. You know, I kind of made a big splash when I did this five backpack review originally and it was like, it, it, that's why I tended to do more replicable tests than real world stuff on that particular review. Cause it's like, how am I even going to get five of the same hunts where I can like honestly put these packs head to head? Like what if it rains on one hunt, doesn't rain on the next? What if I'm coming out heavy on one hunt, coming out light the next, you know, terrain, like the, 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 the variables are so different between all of the hunts and testing. It's so important that there's some type of validity and reliability to your test. So you can draw conclusions. You know, you did one thing. Okay. I didn't like that. You make a small change. You go and you hopefully repeat the process and having, having it be so difficult to repeat that, that process, I, I do think makes it a particularly challenging process. It does. It does. Especially with some pieces of gear are just harder to test than others. The yeah. a gator is a prime example. You could take it out this time of year. We have a ton of snow on the ground. Yeah. You get that testing. That's great. But what about early season or on glaciers when, you know, the glacier sand, glacier silt, there, there's just all of these different variables of the times of year. You're pretty limited. You have to be in there at a certain spot. Yeah. So yeah, it can be very difficult. Okay. So let's, let's go current day now. What are, what are some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that you see Stone Glacier is currently facing? Um, I think some of the challenges, a lot of manufacturing companies like us, uh, because at the root of it, that's that's what we're doing is we're making a product. We're still dealing with some of the backlash of uh, product or uh, raw material availability, yeah. um, the shipping, uh, those types of things that have come a little bit more in line where it's accessible. But just trying to manage all the different materials that you have because all you need is a shortage on one and you can't produce that yeah. specific product. So those, those are things, all the lead times on our materials are getting longer. I would say on average, I would say almost every material that we use is double the lead time to what it was pre COVID. 
I mean, rough numbers across the board. Some of them are even longer. Right. So it becomes a, it becomes a management portion. And then, um, but just like everybody else, we're, we're learning to deal with it and doing our best with it. So I would say those are some of the biggest, um, some of the biggest battles that, that we're facing, uh, just like everybody else in the business. And as far as opportunity, I would say to continue on the path that, that we're on, where we be, a, as a team and, and me as a designer, I try to be very hyper-focused on the products that we come to market with and make sure that they're not competing with products that we already make. Are they, are they solving a problem? Uh, making sure that we're not just making something to make something and allow revenue to drive what we're doing. To be very thoughtful about our products and our offerings and, and also be very thoughtful about when new products come out, making sure they fit into our lineup and and that they make sense and so um, those are some of our biggest opportunities are to fill fill those gaps in that we that we have not yet one one last uh, to backstep a sec one last product uh, design question I've always been curious about you guys have very clearly never come out with a camo and I'm sure you've been asked this to death and I think I could you know maybe make my own guesses but I'd be very interested to know a you know, why have you have you always stuck with the solids? And B, do you think that will always be the case? Well, as far as the reason why we've always stuck to the solids, it really started with the backpacks okay. because there were different types of, of camouflage cordures out there that we could have used in the very beginning. But I guess in my feeling was is I had, and I have to believe that there are the people out there like there, I had some really high tech gear all in camo that sat in in my closet for all but about two months of the year right maybe a little bit longer and i felt it was the same way with the backpack and that's why we stuck with a the solid there is that I mean, you have a backpack that'll carry 150 plus pounds that weighs in at five pounds rough numbers that's a fantastic backpacking like it, all, all, all kinds of our of our um, customers are out backpacking. They're they're exploring the wilderness and they're they're, they're yep. going back into mountain lakes. They are ice climbing. They're doing all these other activities outside there. But it kind of crosses the whole spectrum of all of our products and and particularly the 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 apparel where so many of these products work well all year round. So if you're going to spend three to $400 on a jacket, it'd be really nice to be able to use it or feel comfortable using it outside of those two months. And I'm not saying you can't use camo, but I don't prefer to wear camo when I go up to the ski mountain or yeah. there are just times that I'm, I'm not going to be carrying that. You know what I've never really thought about? I even feel weird when I go scouting, like you get out of the gas station in March. And you know what I mean? You're going to set some cams and you're wearing your, but that's my hiking gear. Like this is the quick drying water resistant, well fitting gear that I own to walk around in the mountains. I don't own any other stuff, but I never really actually, you do feel a little bit weird, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think you can. And, but really that's, that's really where the no camouflage came from. Okay. And the other thing is, is a lot of our colors, you find that, not everybody agrees, or there are some people that are very passionate about wearing camouflage. Yeah. They might wear a camouflage top, but then they'll wear one of our pair of pants that goes with it or vice versa. And, and then there's also the argument, obviously have no scientific data to back this, but one of the things when I look at even my, my own set of apparel when I go hunting is I have a different color pair of gaiters and different color pants and different colored the backpack's going to be a different color and you're buying a harness, you really end up with a color scheme that breaks up the human form. Right. And I know that it doesn't operate exactly like camouflage does, especially at a, at a close range, but that's really my focus when I'm out there is I'm not all in one color where they see just one continuous uh, pattern. And um, so there are some ways around it, as far as offering camo, we 
we don't have anything in the future planned for it. Okay. I'm not going to say, you know, never say never, but at this point, it's just, yeah, it's, it's not on the menu for us. Well, it clearly hasn't hurt, you know, the growth trajectory thus far. So I think you guys are quite, quite fine. I think it's an interesting, you know, flag to, to plant. And I do think, you know, I'm always very interested in kind of like tribalism and, and, marketing and that kind of stuff. And I do think that part of the success of Stone Glacier was that you were attractive to other demographics other than the hardcore hunters. Like I guarantee there's people wearing Stone Glacier that don't even hunt because I mean, the stuff looks cool and it looks nice and it fits well and it operates very well. And I don't think you would say the same for like Kuyu. Like you're, if you're not trying to kill something, you're not going to be walking around in Kuyu for the, for the most part. Um, Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I want to respect your time. There's only a few minutes left. So I want to take a a sharp left-hand turn and talk about goat hunting. So a little bit of, a little bit of context. Two years ago, I did my first solo winter goat hunt. So Northwestern BC, right on the coast, hardest hunt I've, I've ever done. Snowshoes, kind of crampons, the whole nine yards. Um, Saw some goats, didn't kill a goat, had a blast. There was, I I would argue even more so than sheep hunting. I think it's winter goat hunting is the most technical hunting you can do. And maybe somebody else would argue, but just in my own experience, from a gear perspective alone, it has provided more challenges than anything else I've I've ever had to do. And I'm about to, I'm, I'm planning now, I'm, go, I'm going up for seven to 10 days, kind of the first half of, of January. Again, Northern BC, I drew a tag this year. So the area, it should be a little bit better as far as opportunity than the last one, which was an over-the-counter tag. But I would be interested from a, from a gear perspective and even from a psychology perspective, how do you approach winter goat hunting? And I realize that's a bit vague, but would just like to open it up to the conversation. Um, I start, I start with the gear list. Okay. So, so knowing, knowing that, cause you're, you're full on winter, like that, yep. that's January. You're going to see, you can see anything. Yep. And so, yeah, I think, I think that starting with the gear list and sleep system, shelter, making sure though, those, those are dialed to start because really when you get down to it, that that's your last line of defense, right? When everything else happens and a storm sets in, you get wet, whatever it is, that's going to be your last line to, to stay warm. And then from there, I uh, moved to travel. So are you going to be on skis with skins? Do you even need those? Is it snowshoes? Um, crampons would be an absolute must in, in my opinion. Um, some sort of ice axe for, for self arrest. Uh, and, um, we roll through them. And then of course, moving into your layers, there's a lot of times where you're going to be in a spot where you're glassing quite a bit before you're moving. Because the one thing I found about, especially late season goat hunt is that unlike in September or these other times you have to be at least in my experience you have to you have to be more aware of how much you're moving right because it takes so much more <sighs> effort to travel from one spot to another and the problem is is if you have 18 inches of snow but you're on a steep hill that still can be bucking up over your oh, over your knees and your thighs and it just is really really slow going and then you have the whole moisture portion so it, you can't just decide you're going to just walk them down. Right. Yeah. I, I've found that you have to be much more planned about where are you going to glass from? What areas do you think there are going to be in um, covering that area, systematically moving to the other one, opposed to just kind of bomb in somewhere and search and destroy. And th- I have had better experience or uh, b- better luck with that. Um, so that that's really where I, where I start is just kind of with, with your whole kit. That might be one of the most fundamental learnings I had from the first trip was just how drastically I overestimated my kind of distance covering capacity. Like I was halfway through day one and I was like, okay, I need to cut 
every single estimate I made in half, at least. Like two, three miles was a phenomenal day. And in my head, when I was mapping things out, I'm covering six, seven, thinking I'm being conservative at six, seven miles a day. Cause I can cover 10 in, in most sheep country on a, on a reasonable day. So I'm, I'm thinking six, seven and, uh, yeah, halfway through for the th- first day, it's like two o'clock in the afternoon. I've gone a mile and a half. I'm puking sweat. Everything is soaking wet. I'm just like, oh my God. Like this is unlike anything I've I've ever been through before. Like I um it's the grind of it too. Like I don't think people understand, especially like people go snowshoeing, but you're on trails, they're recreational areas. When you're cutting fresh trail constantly. I don't think people understand like the physical drain that is. And just, you can barely do that without sweating. And then because of the inclement weather, you're limited in how many layers you can actually take off. So you're kind of in this like, you know, moisture management catch 22, where you're going to be generating heat no matter what you do. And you have to leave on so many layers, or you're going to be soaking wet from the outside, no matter what you do. Like, and that's why I saying earlier, like, I really do think it's one of the most challenging technical hunts to prepare for from a, from a gear perspective. Now, one of the tips somebody gave me the other day, and I would be interested on your feedback, he, and, and, and he's taken a couple of goats in his time. He was like, if it's early enough in the hunt, I would actually try and spend a couple of days looking at the same goats and trying to pattern them because it might take you so long to kind of get up where they are. And maybe this is following up on your don't just charge head first for you. Where do you draw that line? And maybe it changes as the hunt goes from, I see a goat. Do I sit and watch? Do I go after it? And what are some of the variables you're looking at to help you make that decision? Well, uh, in my experience, it's been, of course, once you find the goats deciding, is it a Billy? Is it a nanny? Right. Is it something that, that I'm interested in? And then, so that obviously is step one, but then the next step really gets defined more so by the terrain, I think for me, because there's a lot of times, as you've said, especially late season, January, when there's that much snow on the ground that it's just not, it's either not possible to get there or it might be really tough to get down. Even if you're able to make the shot, the goat might end up in a spot you can't get to. And if you're by yourself, you have to take that portion into account as well. So there are a lot of times where you either need to pattern or you need to wait until they move into a spot that's more accessible. And so, yeah, that's that's really good advice. And, of course, it, it also depends, too, if you're archery hunting or rifle hunting because right. just the distance – that you're going to have to be being able to pattern them might be very important. Yeah. I almost decided to do this one archery, but I've decided I'm going to stick with the rifle. Uh, It's definitely on my list, but I want it to be an area I've at least scouted and been in before. I almost think it's a bit irresponsible um, to go into an area the first time, especially when it's, when it's open season and I've never, you know, it's any weapon and I've never, I've never taken a goat. So, um, I think it will still be plenty, plenty challenging enough with, uh, with the rifle. Now, when it comes to optics, what's your, what's your strategy? Are you trying to save a little bit of weight? Are you like taking the Hubble out there with you? Yeah. So I, I usually take a Swaro ATX and just because especially that time of year, you can cut off so many miles by using your glass. The, the extra three pounds, four pounds, I have found is worth it. And would you, would you, would you be like 85, 95? Oh, I, you know, I have an 85 and then I have a 65 okay. and I really never carry the 85 anymore. It just, you find the 65 does it? It does because a yeah. lot of times I'm only glassing in the 30 power range. Yeah. And 25 power because you get your biggest field of view. I just haven't noticed enough difference to to carry the extra volume and weight. I think think I'm starting to come to the same conclusion. So I've run a Zeiss Harpy at 95 for the last two full years. 
Um, and I've just decided that I'm going to downsize from that. A, I think the form factor of the 95 is prohibiting. I think if anything, an 85 would be doable, but just the extra inch. And every time I try and put it somewhere, it doesn't fit. And it's just like, so A, I think 95 is, is just too big. And then uh, I'm, I'm about to undergo this kind of exhaustive spotting scope review. That's going to take the next six months, but I've started, I also know a lot of sheep guides who like run a 65 their whole life and that's all they ever run. And my philosophy was any additional confidence I can get would be worth the extra weight. But I almost think it's almost too risk averse now that I'm learning. And it's only because I've taken it that I'm going to be comfortable this year, not taking it. But one of the pieces of glass I'm actually looking at just because I'm lucky enough to have a couple for this review is maybe the Kawa um, 88 or 77 because it's a little bit smaller. Apparently the glass is is really nice. But anyways, glass is another. We have, yeah, we have a couple of guys in the shop that have them and their glass is nice. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm wondering, out, the only thing I've heard is the durability. Like the thing you get with that Swaro ATX is like that peace of mind. Like everybody has run them forever into the ground and they just hold up. So, yeah. you know, um, anyways, Kurt, I, that was phenomenal. I want to, I want to respect your time. Obviously, you know, you're not the guy with the largest social media presence. So people can always follow stone glacier. Is there anything you'd like to say in closing, anything you want to pass on where, what, you know, things people should look out from, look out for from stone glacier in the future. Um, well, every January we do release our new products. So we, uh, yeah, you can take a look at it here towards the end of December. We'll start dropping some of those and, and should have everything out by the first week of January. And yeah, we have some new stuff coming out. Uh, and uh, I think that people have been asking for and be interested in. Do we get any hints? And, oh yeah. <laughs> well, I'll just tell you one, one of them is, uh, we'll have our gloves. Oh, yeah, we'll glove line out. Yeah, with some pretty unique features. So, that's exciting. I'm interested yes. to look at. I've been a bit of, I have really long hand like fingers and gloves have always been like a bit of an issue for me. So I like fancy myself a bit of a glove connoisseur. So I'll be looking forward to checking those out. <laughs> All right, that sounds good. All right, man. Um, thanks again for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, you bet. Thanks for having me on. All right. All thanks, right. Kurt.